So the rationale for these lectures is that all of you have been successful in being part of your uh, national teams to join the burn assessment team training, which is later this year. So the end of October for some of you, beginning of December for others. And we ran a very successful pilot course pre-COVID now and have been a bit delayed by COVID restrictions in the last two years. Uh, but that was a pilot course that seemed to receive um, good feedback and help deliver training to the first five uh, or the, the, the initial five burn assessment teams from across Europe. And we'll be inviting some of them back to help on the course as well. And we wanted to basically remove too many lectures from the course and also give you some pre-course kind of uh, knowledge, I guess, for those of you who are less familiar with the response plan. Some of you may well know it quite well. Now, this is recorded. Um, we would ask you just to be familiar with it before you come on the course. So maybe have a, um, re a review it again uh, sort of in the week or so before. And we will be alluding to it a lot during the course and some of the sessions and the workshops and the simulation will uh, link into the European response plan. Stian is gonna go into detail about the um, context and the rationale and the background to this plan. And he has been instrumental in uh, developing this plan along with his colleagues. Um, burn assessment team training has come about following a need for burn teams to be trained to respond to European uh, mass burn disasters and to share resourcing and expertise. Um, and it's, uh, it's been driven by the uh, DG ECHO. So that's where the funding has come from. Um, and the team that are running the course and delivering these pre-course learnings is a consortium of interburns um, who develop and deliver teaching all over the world in burns and, and capacity building. Um, EBA, of which Diana is part of, the European Burn uh, Association, uh, the Norwegian Directorate of Health, um, the uh, Training and Aid, who's a partner in our training, and Johanneta, who are German uh, collaborators who are very experienced in big MODEX exercises. So hopefully between us, there's enough expertise to uh, deliver you some good training. And I will be sending you all out a participant workbook towards the end of this month. So you have about three months or so to look through it. And that will give a really good overview of the course. And the course essentially is three days of which one day is a full simulation. Um, one day is sort of workshops and small group teamwork, et cetera. And the final day is a debrief where we're gonna extract all the learning that we can take forward to integrate into the response plan and start to help mold our responses because there really hasn't been uh, a, a, a tailored or coordinated uh, big burn response yet. Uh, not to say there won't be in the next few months. Um, and this training is helping us to de de develop really the best approach to that. Um, I will hand over to Stian now, who will give about a half an hour talk on the European response plan. If you're giving up your time this evening, I know you've just been on call for seven days in one of your busiest burns period ever. Uh, so appreciate you giving your time. Um, and um, we will have the talk and then we'll have some questions. And we'll also um, have a chat to who's on screen tonight as well, just to get familiar with each other ahead of the course. So Stian, all yours. Thanks, Amy. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this first virtual lecture, first part of our uh, burn assessment team course. So, uh, well, my name is Dion, and uh, I've been involved in, in developing this um, plan uh, for six years now. And uh, uh, it's been a great experience how this has developed from, from uh, the first discussions into actually a course for burn assessment teams in Europe now. Um, um, okay. So today I'll just, I'll take you through a little bit about the background and rationale of this plan, uh, how it's built and how it, it fits with the existing framework in the EU. Uh, and then uh, I'll take you through a small review of, of some incidents that's happened around the world and how that's relevant when we plan for burn uh, casualty incidents in Europe. And uh, uh, also in the end, we'll speak about specifically about the plan and the mechanisms in the plan as it is in the moment. Uh, and um, many of you attending are burn experts, but some of you are also from the authority side. So um, I'm not the expert on the uh, union civil protection mechanism that will be covered in the next talk. Uh, but, uh, uh, and for those of you who are burn experts, uh, we won't go into details about burn care because you all know it. And the intent of this course is not to, uh, throughout this training, is not to 
to teach you how to treat burns because you know how to treat burns. It's to you know implement this within a system that makes us able to cooperate uh, with within a mass casualty incident. So to the background of this plan and how what happened that made it uh, or initiated it. Well, of course, uh, many many of you remember what happened in Romania in two thousand and fifteen, uh, and. We have to say that, that what happened there is one of the main reasons why this plan was ever developed, but also some coincidental, uh, uh, at the time, things that were happening in, in within the UCPM mechanism that I'll talk more about that made it possible to pass forward into uh, building a burns plan. Now, at the time when this big incident happened in Romania, uh, actually, there was no mechanism available. So Romania can just uh, ask for, for a, or push a, a big red button and make us all come, come to aid and make it all happen because there was nothing really prepared to deal with such an incident. So everything had to be done ad hoc. And when things were done ad hoc, things take a lot more time. And therefore things during that response and, and relating that response afterwards, we understood that these things took too long and to be able to actually efficiently help each other in such an instant in the future, we need to prepare something. Uh, we need to make pre-ranged uh, management systems. And actually in the EU for many, many years, there has been an existing framework for helping uh, and aiding each other. Uh, and that is the union civil protection mechanism. Um, so if there's flooding somewhere in the EU, teams can come from different countries and help out. If there's forest fires, um, all types of incidents. And also uh, eventually this, I think this plan is almost 20 years old now, uh, if I'm not wrong. And um, eventually the, the idea of implementing medical assistance in this system has came up and, and uh, in 2016, the EU uh, uh, decided to establish uh, what they call the European Medical Corps. So uh, implementing emergency medical teams and medical uh, assistance in the UCPM mechanism. And since this was uh, almost the same time being developed as the incident in Romania um, and uh, and many countries in Europe, of course, including Romania, were pushing to get burns to be one of the first priorities to be included in such a medical framework. So there was a, uh, all member states and participating states were invited to a, a meeting in Brussels in May, 2016 to discuss this. And in the aftermath, uh, the European Burn Association in September, 2016, were asked to, to provide medical guidelines for such a uh, framework. And uh, also the WHO were at the time establishing a technical working group on emergency medical team, within the emergency medical teams um, 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 framework of the WHO, uh, they were establishing this group on mass burn casualties. Uh, so there was some cooperation between these groups as well. Uh, and of course, the EU is used to working with WHO guidelines in, in, in implementing emerging medical teams. They, they do uh, combine verification of these teams with the WHO. Uh, and uh, for the Burns part, it all came out as a work staff, um, commission staff working document in January 2020. Uh, which is the basis of, or the template of, of the future plan for, um, for burn assistance in a mass casualty incident in Europe. Uh, this was, uh, so the timeline of what happened since the incident in Romania and to this point today is that a lot of meetings and a lot of working with documents and trying to make things work within the existing frameworks and then ending up in a pilot training course that we held in uh, January, 2020, which was the basis of the course that you are now participating. So after evaluating that course, uh, 
Um, uh, a new course was developed on that basis, and that's the course you're now attending. And uh, this was thoroughly evaluated by all the uh, partners and um, by the DG Echo of the Commission. So let's make a short walk through the history of burn mass casualty incidents globally. Um, not extensively, but if you look into a paper from 2017, who reviewed uh, the geographical distribution of burn disasters uh, for a 15 year period, it, it's obvious that it's more uh, common in, in, um, in uh, low income countries, but it is, uh, there are incidents, mass casualty incidents with burns happening also in high income countries. And uh, the reports of such incidents is actually increasing over the years, maybe because more is getting reported than, uh, than before. But increasingly, terrorist attacks are uh, the cause of also burn uh, victims. And if thinking about burn care in general, we know that our burn care, uh, quality of burn care is improving and mortality is decreasing. So more people survive from, from burn injuries on a normal day. So our public, they will, uh, they will ex have certain expectations and quite high expectations of burn care on a normal day. And this will be extrapolated into expectations for burn care in disasters. But from years back in disasters, there is a, uh, there is a common line of thinking that, well, uh, we can only do the best that we can do. But there's been some incidents that have proved that actually it is possible with very systematic approaches, well-prepared uh, uh, management, even in disasters, it is possible to uh, provide very high quality care for a high number of people in a Burns incident. Well, this is only possible if we know that our decreasing mortality in burn care is because we do centralized burn care in burn centers. Burn care is enormously resource demanding. We know that uh, uh, to treat uh, uh, eight, 20% burns is not the same as, as, uh, as treating 80% uh, burn. Uh, is not a linear graph. It is an exponential in the end. So the larger burns are enormously resource demanding and survivability from large burns are only possible if you have intensive care treatment for a long period of time. And we as burns physicians know that our burn patients, they don't go to surgery only for the first week, they go to surgery for many months if there's a really large burn on a regular basis. And this intensive care and wound care is such a, a resource in demanding endeavor. Uh, so uh, it can only be done in burn centers. So to be able to provide uh, burn care in a mass uh, casualty incident, we need to help each other because in each country, there are not that many burn centers. And if you look to my country, we're only one burn center. And then we have some of the larger countries in, in Europe, they will have um, tens of burn centers, many burn centers and many available beds. So the larger countries might be able to handle very large incidents within themselves. But most countries, if there is an incident of the extent that happened in Romania in 2015, there's not many countries, if none, if any, that can, uh, can handle such an incident by themselves. So the option is to either say that it's a disaster, we cannot provide care, or we can share uh, the burden. And uh, that's the basis of, of the European burn plan is that if we share, and in any given day, if we stretch our resources, we can, uh, we can care uh, together for quite a large number of burns and still provide good burn care for these patients. But then we know that things needs to happen quite timely. There is not much time, but there is some differences between burns and other trauma that give us some time. There is this winter opportunity that I'll talk to, but also 
and there's this issue that we as burn uh, physicians know that uh, if we try, if we say that, well, uh, we should have this plan that we should do, we should do as much as we can ourselves and maybe get some outside help in our burn center, then we can care for many burns. But it is, uh, this is a simul um, theoretical simulations we have done in our center on, on uh, accumulating uh, 20, um, 20 patients uh, with major burns that have been had real treatment and then accumulated the time in surgery that they these patients in real time had during their first 14 days of stay. And if you put them on top of each other, meaning let's say we did the same care of these patients simultaneously, for 20 patients, you're adding up to almost 400 hours of theater time for the first 14 days. So the resource demand, the resource draw for this is enormous. So uh, the other option is to try to, to dispatch these patients and do uh, quick um, assessments of how that can be done and then uh, share the burden. And uh, that sharing of the burden is not something that we just came up with uh, uh, after the Romanian incident. Uh, it is something that has been parts of plans in many parts of the world and also been tried in disasters uh, and found it's an efficient system. Uh, so uh, within such a system, um, we all understand that an international response cannot be the first response. So burn patients will be uh, dispatched from the site of, of the incident to hospitals uh, as within the normal system in that country or in that region. There's no international plan that has a place in that first, uh, in these first hours. But uh, once these patients get to the primary hospitals, and if we have a system in place in each country uh, that can provide good assessments of these patients in these first receiving hospitals, and then aid these assessment by international teams arriving within the first 24, 48 hours, then uh, it is possible to make assessments of these burns in such a fashion that we can dispatch them to other burn centers. And that's the basis of the thinking around this plan. And uh, this, uh, why it is possible is because burn, center, burn patients in the first uh, day during resuscitation, they're unstable because of resuscitation, but then there's a stable period for these patients before they start getting a rise in infections. And this stable window post resuscitation before you, you uh, or if you delay surgery, uh, normally most of us will do surgery on day one or two, but uh, it, it is possible to stabilize these patients in that period of time uh, and then have a transportation before surgery so as to share the resources and the burden of taking care of these patients. And uh, if we extrapolate the mortalities that we know happen in, after the Romanian incident, the mortalities could follow this in somewhat uh, this uh, timeline that we know that it is an increasing uh, uh, accumulating infection rate uh, after some days but not in the very beginning. Uh, so to the details of, our, uh, of the European burn plan as it is drafted in the moment. Well, the overall aim of the plan is of course, to be able to provide specialized burn care for all patients in a major burn uh, from the, uh, for, for all patients with major burns from a mass casualty incident in Europe. Uh, and there are three elements in the plan. It's burn experts, burn care capacities, and medevac capacities. And how it is thought to be built together is that uh, by sharing the burden, we can have one, we can have burn experts coming from one country or one center, and, and another center or another country offer burn beds, meaning burn care capacities, and yet another country can offer medevac capacities. Um, Medevac capacities are already uh, in the voluntary pool of the, uh, of the um, Union Civil Protection Mechanism. 
and uh, um, and these three elements then make it possible that to not drain one country with the scarce resources in burn care for all their capacity for both both burn beds and burn experts, but but we can then combine our efforts and share the burden. Um, and these burn assessment teams uh, are supposed to be the teams that you are now put together as a coordination expert, and then three uh, burn experts. And the burn experts are uh, should be one intensivist and a surgeon and a burn nurse. And the objectives of the burn assessment team's mission is to provide highly specialist burn care expertise bedside and in the hospitals to be able to aid and support local staff and local authorities in doing that initial um, specialized assessment of the burn depth and extent and the care needed for that specific patient. Um, and I'd imagine in the future, if uh, some countries with many burn centers will have be able to train many of these teams themselves. And so even with the large response, there's no need to have outside burn teams coming into that country because they're all trained in this system. Uh, but for smaller countries like my own, we would always be depending on outside teams coming in to our country and helping us assessing the patients efficiently uh, and effectively within the first couple of days to be able to transport the ones that need burn center care outside. And also we know the reason why it might seem uh, uh, strange that one needs burn experts to assess burns, but we know that from, from uh, non-expert assessment of burns that the, the, ex the extent of misinterpretation of burn extent and depth is enormous. So that in that there's an enormous uh, risk of um, not be able to provide proper care for the patient or even the misuse of resources so uh, that's where the burn teams come in to make sure that the people or patients that really need care will are, are prioritized for that care and transfer for such care. And the ones who do not need it uh, will not be transferred abroad. And to be able to do this systematically and reproducibly, uh, there has been made assessment uh, sheets or forms so there's a standardized assessment form of how to assess the wounds and the general status, intensive care status of the patient. And in the bottom uh, right corner of the assessment sheet, there's a recommendation part. And that recommendation part, you, you use standardized triage uh, system that is based on a, uh, on a well-published system from the American Burn Association. Um, that gives us in the end a triage priority with low resource situations and high resource situations. Um, and there are some specific medical guidelines also uh, provided in the staff working document uh, that sits in the, the uh, commission site. Uh, there's reference or links to some more specific medical guidelines. And these medical guidelines sit in the Euro European Burn Assessment uh, Association's uh, website. And these uh, include uh, transport guidelines uh, and, uh, um, and more specific care guidelines. So the aim of all of this is to be able to efficiently and this is what you're going to be training in in the course is to understand the European, the, the Union Civil Protection Mechanism, how you as burn experts and authority experts can uh, work together in a systematic approach and be efficient uh, and use the existing uh, frameworks uh, to both assess patients and get them dispatched to care in other centers as needed. Uh, and. Uh, to support local authorities um, in such decision-making uh, as requested. So I'll try to go through it. Um, 
so it's understandable how it's it's theoretically supposed to work. Now, if there's a mass burn casualty incident in a country, there is no uh, overall EU plan telling that country how to do it. So everything that happens within a country or a local region will have to go by their local plans. And that might be different in, a, in many countries, but that uh, local plan will kick in and a national plan might at some point kick in. And in those plans, there should be a trigger point to when to activate a European plan. And the idea of the European plan is not to wait many days and see if you're able to make the stretch yourself. It is uh, the thinking behind it is to activate early, trigger, trigger the plan early and de-escalate if, if it's not needed, but activate and make ready. And the UCPM activation will then go through what's called the ERCC uh, the coordination center in Brussels. They will receive the request for assistance from the country in need, and they will then send that request to all the member states and participating states of the UCPM. Uh, which and these countries will then um, um, activate within their countries according to their plans. Most likely, then speaking to their burn centers about burn beds and burn teams and speaking to their medevac capacities, whether or not they can activate a medevac capacity. So uh, a country can then send out the burn team to help uh, with secondary assessment in hospital assessments of these patients, and which will then inform the selection and patient dispatch. And medevac teams uh, will then take these patients for long-term care in, in burn centers. And this is, makes it a little bit tricky and a little bit different from many other UCPM activations, which are short term, because the end of the line for these burn patients, because they don't need two weeks of care, they might need months of care, it is long term and there's costs involved. And from the history, uh, we know that uh, these things can make it really difficult and really time consuming to get to this. And one of the issues with long-term care is, is it safe? Can we trust burnt care in another country? How do we know that our burn center uh, um, or the burn center in the other country can you give our patients the same care as in our country? And uh, this is an issue for us as clinicians, of course, but also for the decision makers and our authority side and our politicians that will have to defend this system where we send our patients to other centers. So there might be a need for trust uh, more because this is long-term care more than in, in some other incidents. And so, but there is this option of, of specifying in, this is from the template of the staff working document on the burn plan now. Uh, so the template of offering assistance. So there's this, when you offer burn beds, you can highlight whether your center that you offer burns in will do have an international recognized quality label. If there's some organization that has uh, made sure or that one can refer to uh, as the guidelines, um, uh, steering guidelines for the care in your center. And in Europe, we have a verification system uh, available to support burn care and to support hospitals and authorities in, in making sure that their care is, um, uh, is at the level that they would like it to be. And uh, this is, uh, it's been, has been rolled out for the last decade now, the European Burn Association's verification so this is an offer for countries in Europe. And uh, of course, personally, we as burn physicians think this is an important guarantee that our burn patients will get good care that they are sent to a verified center. It's not a prerequisition to be able to offer care. Uh, other centers can of course offer care in, in this um, uh, UCPM mechanism. And the country that requests assistance 
will always be uh, the have you know make their own decisions of whether or not to to uh, make use of of an offer and they don't have to choose a verified center but in the case where there is uh, a need to uh, to make sure that the burn care is of good quality this is the only available verification system in Europe at the moment and uh, it has been supported by the uh, Commission, uh, European Commission over the last uh, three years now, uh, rolling out verification in more and more countries of Europe, um, uh, supporting burn care standards. So uh, as a summary, I'll take you through how we think this will work and hope this will work in the future if something happens in one of our countries. Well, if there's an incident, local capacities will be activated according to normal plans and they will be transported to the nearest hospitals. Let's call these primary hospitals. So these primary hospitals, so when, when preparing for local incidents, these hospitals or our hospitals will have to, will have to prepare for a surge capacity, a temporarily increased capacity for the first 72 to 96 hours. So that's the period that you will have to care for your patients by, your own, by yourself on your own. Uh, and if you know this, when you do your planning, you can, you can, um, you can uh, make less palliation decisions because of resources uh, and make more patients survive because you know you will get help. So you can have, uh, but then you need triggers. So you will have in your uh, national plan and your local plan triggers to go to the next level. And the national plan, there will be communication between uh, the burn centers or the hospitals that are uh, not have received these patients and the authority side and uh, the national authorities um, will then uh, be able to activate the European plan by requesting assistance from the ERCC. And this uh, request for assistance will then be communicated to all member states and participating states. And these states can then offer their burn care beds, their burn assessment teams, or their medevac capacities all, none, or some. And um, this will then, through the ERCC, be communicated back uh, to the hospitals and the country requesting assistance so that burn teams can arrive at primary hospitals if needed, if there's no national teams available. Uh, and, um, and patients will then be able to travel to European burn centers where there's beds available. And if every, all this is US teams are well-trained, the, all the centers uh, know about this plan, the countries have established good plans for burn incidents, this can be done quickly and efficiently, but it's depending on national planning. And of course, there's no plan that will survive first impact. So we always need to plan, exercise and revise. And that's what we're gonna do now with the courses you're going through even. We're gonna use the information and the expertise we gather in doing these courses to improve for the future. Uh, and I think there's some universal factors for success uh, of mass casualty burn plans. As for any mass casualty management, there is a need for national leadership. And we know, need to know each other uh, within the country. And, um, and also we need to be part of an existing system where people know what to do and how to do it. Uh, every country should develop their own plan for mass casualty management and for burns specifically and uh, they should adapt new plans and existing mechanisms and structures. So 
even though we're very different in each country, how things are done or how things are structured, we can, uh, the European burn plan is very generic in its, in its composition. So it, uh, it should be possible to adopt it into local structures and mechanisms as needed. Uh, but the most important thing is the last point to have early uh, activation and make sure that this, uh, that burn teams and burn beds and medevac capacities are made really uh, swiftly available if needed. Time is of essence. We need to transport these patients within the first four days and uh, you need to plan your decision-making because, uh, and I, that's why I think it's so important that we have these burn courses now and that you get, and that the authority side as coordinators are part of it because then the burns people and the authority people get to know each other. We know when, from the history that when, when an incident happens and there's no plan in place and there's no prior knowledge of each other, there's all these questions of who's this guy calling, who's this, what is happening? And uh, all these small things and these small questions of how to do it, there's no plan for this, uh, makes the need for ad hoc and that takes time. So each step will take too much time and then there's no possibility uh, in the end to, to be of aid to each other. Thank you.